Let me pray for us as we jump in uh, this morning. Father, in uncertain times, uh, we desire that you would cultivate in us a rock-solid faith. And God, this morning we are looking at one of the most uh, important questions uh, in our life, and we want to be transformed. We want to find a firm foundation in your Son and a framework in which to live in today's up-and-down, shaky, uncertain world. So God, would you fix our eyes just firmly on Christ? Would you give us a clear picture of who he is and what he's done uh, that we would find ourselves with a rock-solid faith today? That we would live with a a high joy, that we would live with a, a certain hope, that we would live actively and obediently by the power of your spirit. God, give us a rock solid faith. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I received an email uh, this week. I've never received an email from this guy. His name is David Barrett. He is the CEO of Expensify. I found this uh, a little weird. Expensify is uh, uh, the administrative tool we use. It's an app that a lot of kind of small businesses use uh, kind of for back office stuff, for uh, reimbursements, for uh, logging travel expenses, things like that. Uh, It's an easy way to uh, uh, expense uh, this or that action within your business. And uh, it's a a multi-million dollar company. And Uh, David Barrett uh, emailed me directly as he emailed millions of Expensify users. The CEO talking right to the users of Expensify. And here's uh, what he said in the subject line, save democracy, vote for Biden. And he wrote in the body of the email, I know you don't want to hear this from me. And I guarantee I don't want to say it. But we are facing an unprecedented attack on the foundations of democracy itself. If you are a U.S. citizen, anything less than a vote for Biden is a vote against democracy. That's right. I'm saying a vote for Trump, a vote for a third party candidate or simply not voting at all is as though you are saying I am confident standing aside and allowing democracy to be methodically dismantled in plain sight. He goes on, he lists a a bunch of questions that he would anticipate the reader would have. Things like, why do you care so much about this? Or, what gives you the right to tell me what to do? And he answers kind of all these questions. And and then he uh, asks this question, uh, anticipating our questions. But you're a company. Shouldn't you remain neutral? Listen to his answer. Expensify depends on a functioning society and economy. Not many expense reports get filled out during a civil war. As a CEO of this business, it's my job to plot a course through any storm. And all, and he goes on and he goes on. Don't you think you're exaggerating a bit is another anticipated question he believes the uh, reader will ask. Don't you think you're exaggerating a bit? He answers, I truly wish I was. I wouldn't be sending this email if this election were just about normal issues like taxes and legislative priorities or health care, but it isn't. This election is a referendum on what limits, if any, we place on our elected leaders to govern us in a fair and representative way. Uh, Do you hear in his email what you have probably heard all over your lives these past few months? Uh, Maybe you've heard it in an email or a phone message or a a video that is sent to you from your parents uh, from the other side to say, "If, if Trump doesn't get in office, then Marxism and socialism will destroy us. If Biden doesn't get in, we're doomed. If Trump doesn't get in, we're doomed. We need a savior. And the wrong person in office will kill us, destroy us, dismantle us. We will have no hope. It's the very question uh, 29 that we will look at this week. In the New City Catechism, how can we be saved? How can we be saved? 
Who, who can save us? Uh, how can I put myself in a position where I know I am secure, where I know my hope in the future is sure? Uh, how can I put myself in a place where, where I know there is salvation on the other side of today? How can we be saved? And the answer is given only by faith in Jesus Christ, in his substitutionary atoning death on the cross. So even though we are guilty of having disobeyed God and are still inclined to all evil, nevertheless, God, without any merit of our own, but only by pure grace, imputes to us the perfect righteousness of Christ when we repent and believe. How can we be saved? Is it through my job and giving myself a security here or there in elevation and a growing bank account? Is it in a relationship that I have or don't yet have that if it just went this way or that way or if I just had this child then I would have everything I wanted? Uh, how can I be saved? Is it through the right elected leaders, the right laws, uh, the right leaders, the right politics, the right education? How can I I be saved? Is it through gaining enough morality that I could stand in front of myself and before others and say, I'm good enough? David Barrett, your parents, your friends, your Facebook stream, all has an answer. Today our eyes are laser focused on it heading towards November 3rd. We need the right leader to save us. And, and God would answer, that is the truth. But, but if your government flourishes or crumbles, it will never save. No matter if it flourishes or it crumbles, it cannot save. How can we be saved? Even the question is a bit, uh, uh, the answer to this question is a bit confusing. That's why what I want to do this morning is I want to take us right into the heart of a story where uh, this jailer calls out that very uh, simple question. And, and I want to clarify the question and the answer and, and look at this story to answer the question, how can we be saved in a very simple way? And then I want to step back and we'll ask a couple questions that that you can be sure that you are saved and also that we can uh, be uh, certain that we're saved and and can explain how one might be saved in Christ so we'll look at the story then we'll step back and ask a few clarifying questions that uh, we can be certain of our salvation and also uh, sure that we can explain the way to salvation so here is the story. This is Acts chapter 16, verses 25 and following. The context is this. Uh, Paul is gripped by this question and more so the answer to this question, how is one to be saved? He's so gripped by it that, that he's uh, gone on three missionary journeys. He's gone from neighborhood to neighborhood to then uh, region to region all over the known world to bring about the answer to how can one be saved. And, and he is uh, heading uh, uh, through Turkey now up into Greece and he will land in the city of Philippi. It's a, a Roman city that is really kind of leading the way. And he's sharing the gospel with Lydia, and Lydia is uh, this, this woman of high stature. She's an entrepreneur. She's a leader within textiles, and, and she comes to know Christ. And then uh, he is sharing the gospel with this slave girl who is uh, owned by uh, this group that they would uh, find gain through her in her divination, her fortune telling. They, they, they are using her, as she tells the future, uh, to make money. And, and this enslaved girl who's enslaved within and enslaved without, she, she starts following Paul around in Acts chapter 16 right before the story we'll focus on. And she starts yelling, uh, these men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And she's following them around yelling this, and it's a bit disruptive. And, and Paul looks back, the text says he's annoyed with her. Probably the word is better translated, grieved by her situation. And she's yelling, these guys are telling you about how to be saved. 
Uh, but then he looks at her and grieved at her situation, seeing that she's enslaved by uh, these men who are using her for gain and, and seeing that she's uh, captured by a demon. He, he calls the demon out of her and, and she is rescued in Christ. And, and, but then the owners see in verse 19, the owners see that their hope for gain, monetary gain through her is lost. So they're angry, and they seize Paul and Silas, and they drag him into the marketplace. They erect the Bema seat, a place of judgment, and they uh, kind of do this mock trial, and the Romans uh, decide right then. They strip uh, Paul and Silas of their garments. They beat them with rods, and then they put them in prison. And in verse 24, uh, 23 and 24, they've ordered this jailer to keep them there safely, to keep them in prison. They, they lock the, uh, Paul and Silas in stocks and put them in the heart of the prison. And the jailer is given the task to watch over them. The jailer is going to be the one who yells out that question that we're asking this morning. What must I do to be saved? It's about midnight, verse 25. And Paul and Silas are praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners are listening to them. <laughs> when their minds should have been on critiquing the systems of injustice around them, or when their hearts should have been sunk low in, in, in destitute uh, state, uh, instead their, their minds are cast towards a greater praise uh, and lifts them above their situation, and they are praising God. And singing hymns and praying to him. And the jailers uh, are listening and the prisoners are listening. And suddenly there's a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison are shaken. And immediately all the doors are open and everyone's bonds are unfastened. And God comes in might and in power in answer to their prayers. And, and there's this huge earthquake and the, 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 the jail crumbles at its foundations around them. And, and uh, Paul and Silas, his bonds are set free. God acts in a powerful way to rescue and to save them. Certainly everyone in the moment is shocked. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword. He's about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. See, the jailer is standing before the very power of God who is answering the prayers of the prisoners that he has locked up. And he knows he is against this power who is acting on this prison right now. He, he knows he stands e eternally under the weight of this power that has come to bear on his prison and his prisoners. He also knows uh, that he is shamed before his community. Uh, they expected him to guard the prisoners and now uh, he assumes that they're all gone. They're free. He's failed at his job. He's also legally bound here. Uh, he will replace the prisoners with his own death. It, it will be uh, his cost which will make up for the loss of the prisoners. So he, he's, he's legally at blame. He is uh, culturally shamed in community. And he stands before this mighty power of heaven that's been poured on his jail. He draws a sword to kill himself. He has seen the power of God and he is terrified. But... Paul, verse 28. But Paul cried in a loud voice, do not harm yourself, we're all still here. <laughs> Don't harm yourself, oh, we are still here. Uh, Paul and Silas pour out the mercy of God in this moment. They stayed in the jail. Uh, the jailer will not have to sacrifice his own life to replace them. The jailer is not shamed for losing them. Uh, the, the jailer now realizes that, that the power that is uh, at their hand in the Almighty God is now uh, being poured out on him in mercy. The power of God and the mercy of God collide in this moment for the jailer. And Paul says, don't harm yourself, we're still here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and he said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? <laughs> what must I do to be saved? 
And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. He says, I'll do anything to be saved. You just tell me. I've seen the power of God. I've seen the mercy of God. And, and now I want to know from you, how am I saved? What must I do? Do I need to live a more moral life? Do I need to convert to Judaism? Uh, do I need to do this or that to, to live up to the standard of salvation, to, to see that power and that mercy of God poured out on me? What must I do? And they say simply, don't do anything. Just believe. Just receive the work that Jesus Christ has done and you will be saved, you and your whole household. Verse 32, and they speak the word of the, the gospel, the good news of the Lord to him and to all who are in his household. And he took them at the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them into his house and set food before them and he rejoiced along with his entire household, that he believed in God. <laughs> not only did uh, salvation come to him that day, but then he responds. He, he's not just lifted above the situation with new joy and rejoicing and hope. He goes deep into the situation and brings uh, justice and restoration, washing their wounds and, and walking with them, feeding them, rejoicing with them after he's baptized in obedience. Uh, the jailer is absolutely transformed by the good news that there's nothing he ought to do to be saved, but he ought to believe to receive the salvation that has been purchased for him in Christ. So here's what I want to do. I want to step back from the story and just ask a couple of questions to help clarify for us. Uh, are we saved and are we able to explain how to be saved to someone who is asking, what must I do to be saved? The first question I want us to ask is, what gets a person there to this point where he or she cries out, what must I do to be saved? What gets a person there is the very sovereign act of God to open our eyes to the power and the mercy of God poured out on us in a way that it shakes our foundations. He looks up and he says, Oh, my Lord, <laughs> I, I am guilty with my community. I'm guilty legally, and I'm guilty before you. I've seen your power, how it, how it came pouring down on this prison. Uh, but then he also sees God's mercy in, in the actions of Paul and Silas to say, we stayed here with you. We didn't run away. You're saved. You're free because uh, what ought to have been done to you will not happen to you because of the mercy of God. It must be brought there by the sovereign God who opens our eyes to his power and his mercy. It might be in light of our own impotence, our inability to save ourselves. Uh, maybe you're feeling it today when you look at the coming election, or maybe you are feeling it uh, in a health issue or an injustice that's been done to you, and you feel, there's nothing I can do to get out of this. I am impotent. I cannot save myself. And oh, what a sweet place we are getting close to in that moment. Or it might not be uh, a realization of our impotence, but, but an, uh, standing in awe of his goodness or his power. You step out, outside uh, a Great Falls, Virginia, and you look at this giant gorge and this huge river that flows, and you say, oh my, what a powerful creator we have. If, if, if a God made that, there's no way I could stand before him. I'm in awe. Or he does something. He brings about healing in your life, or he provides a job when there was no way to get a job, and, and you just stand back in awe, and you say, wow, there must be a God. I am so grateful for him. How must I be saved? Maybe it's in reflection where you step back and you hear a message uh, on a live stream or you read the book of Romans like Luther did. Luther just sat and read the book of Romans and then uh, it comes to him. I, I am uh, condemned before this God. His power ought to be poured on me. But oh, how I long for his mercy. And in reflection we cry out. What must I do to be saved? It's first an admission that we cannot save ourselves. It's an admission that nothing we have sought for could bring salvation. Our political leaders, our laws, our education, our 
moral steps forward. Nothing could bring salvation. What must I do to be saved? The second question uh, to help us reflect on the story is, well, what must someone do to be saved? (laughs) What does that look like then? Uh, How is one saved? It's helpful if we even look at that concept for a second. What is to be saved? What is is to have salvation? Uh, Jesus gives us a very direct answer to this question. Uh, In John 17, verse 3, he says, This is eternal life. This is salvation, that they would know the only true God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. That we would have a restored relationship with the one true God and that through Jesus Christ whom he has sent. Salvation is having a restored relationship with the one true living God. It's being adopted into his family. It's being forgiven for our wrongs. It's it's being included when we should be excluded. It it is being a part of the family with the one true living God. It's the security that comes from that knowledge. That in all of eternity, we will be secure with this God. It's the hope that comes from that knowledge. that, That I have a sure hope. It's the purpose that comes from that knowledge. Salvation is being restored in right relationship with the one true living God. And how does that occur? Well, Paul, uh, who's uh, really at the center of this story along with the jailer, uh, he'll write a whole bunch of letters to the churches. Uh, He writes one back to the Philippians, and he explains a bit of this there. And he writes one to the Ephesians, and, and probably gives the most clear explanation of how are we to be saved right in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. And he says it this way, it is by grace you have been saved. And this not of your, and through faith, and this not of your own doing, it is the gift of God. It is by grace through faith that we are saved, that God acts upon us to bring salvation. By grace, through faith, the very means of our salvation is not uh, in this act of something we do, what must I do to be saved, but instead it's by something that has already been done. It's, It's the very grace of God. It's by grace, the instrument of grace that God has done to bring about salvation that we would receive through faith is the very work of His Son on the cross. By grace we have been saved. How is his grace enacted upon our lives? What is the good news by which we are saved? Paul, again, uh, as he's talking back to a church in Corinth, says it this way. He says, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preach to you. The good news, the grace uh, of what God has done in Christ. Here it is in its most simple form. I delivered to you at a first and most importance what I received, that one, Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Here's the gospel, the, the good news in simplest of form, that Jesus Christ was sent and he lived this perfect life. Every step of his life, he was obedient to God. His relationship was never broken. It was always right, always good with God the Father. And not only did he live, he then died. He died in our place to pay the wage, the penalty for our sins. And then not only did he die, he then rose to newness of life. This is the good news, the grace by which we are saved. The action that God took to save us was to send his son to live perfectly for us, to be sacrificed on a cross for us, then to be risen to newness of life in the resurrection, to walk with us in relationship with him. By grace. There are a whole bunch of times in the scriptures that this is boiled down in a simple way. Romans 6, 23. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The wage of our sin, our disobedience, is death. But the gift is life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We are to die, but Jesus pays our wage. Or this one. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, 
that whoever believed in him would not perish but have eternal life. God's love motivates him to send his only son who would live a perfect life, die a substitutionary death, and raise to newness of life. Why? That if we would believe, if we would receive, that through faith we would, what? Have eternal life. John 3.16. Mark 10.45. Mark 10.45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life away as a ransom. He died as a ransom to purchase us back from our true enemy, to be the one true Savior, to pay for our sin, to to give us his obedience, to raise the newness of life, that we would have a relationship with the one true living God. We would be his sons. We would be his daughters. We would have hope. We would have security. Why? Because he paid the ransom price to free us. Isaiah 53, 6. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but God has laid on him, Jesus, the iniquity, the sin of us all. We all ran our own ways. Uh, We're sinful people doing sinful things, but God pours on Jesus the iniquity of us all. Why? That we could have newness of life by receiving that gift. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. For he who had no sin became sin for us, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That Jesus who had no sin became sin. He hung on a cross, taking the penalty of sin. Why? That we could become the righteousness of God. How? Through faith. What must I do to be saved? Nothing. Grace has been given in Christ. The ransom has been paid. The wage has been paid. The righteous one wants to give you his righteousness. What must I do? Nothing. Simply what? Receive. That's the through faith. It's not our faith that saves. It's Jesus who saves. It's the gift of his life, his death, his resurrection for you and for me. The grace of God by grace. But how? Through faith. Faith. Through faith. Faith is simply the conduit for salvation. It, faith is kind of just the, uh, uh, the uh, conveyor belt in which salvation comes. That, in a sense, brings us the, the riches of Christ where we can be united with Jesus. Faith is just uh, simply a reception of a gift of grace that has already been accomplished for us in Christ. Uh, right now, we are uh, seeking to find a, um, an antidote, a cure uh, for COVID, right? We, we are wondering, when will the medicine come about where we could be cured or saved uh, from COVID? Uh, when will the vaccine come to bear? Uh, but the big question in that is, uh, will people take it, Right? <laughs> Uh, Will enough people take the antidote, the vaccine, uh, that that it would have any substantial change on on our lives? Uh, uh, Now, here's the reality. Uh, It it, it is not um, our own actions or our own things that will say that the very vaccine itself uh, will bring a cure, will impact our health. But but simply faith in this illustration is is simply saying, I'll I'll take it. (laughs) I'll receive it. It's like this. Faith is just having your hands open. It's not doing anything but receiving everything. Uh, Faith is looking at a chair and saying, I'll sit in it. And you you sit in it. It's it's the chair that supports you. It's the object of your faith that most matters. It is by grace through faith that we have been saved. It's nothing we do ourselves. Even the faith itself is a gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. I want to take us into the definition a a little bit more to some of these uh, terms that uh, Keller lays out for us and and how is a person to be saved. Uh, Because some of these terms we've been bouncing around, the concepts we've been bouncing around, but they're really important for this uh, idea of salvation. The question reads, uh, again, Only by faith in Jesus Christ are we saved in his substitutionary atoning death on the cross. So even though we are guilty of having disobeyed God, we are still inclined to all evil. 
and, and still inclined to all evil. Nevertheless, God, without any merit of our own, but only by pure grace, imputes to us the perfect righteousness of Christ when we repent and when we believe. The, uh, there's a lot of terms in there that make it muddy for us, right? Uh, here they are. Some of the terms in this uh, definition that, that need uh, defining to help bring clarity to how salvation comes. First of all, uh, how are we to be saved? We already said salvation is the restoring of right relationship with the one true living God. Being adopted into his family, being given eternal hope, eternal purpose, eternal security in this relationship with him, which will transform our today and our tomorrow. Salvation. Faith, we've defined as receiving and embracing Jesus Christ. What he has done for us in his life, in his death, and his resurrection. And then Keller says uh, it's by faith in Jesus Christ and his substitutionary atoning death. Well, what the heck is that? Substitutionary atonement is simply that uh, we would receive Jesus' sacrifice in our own place. That we would, by faith, say, yes, you can pay my penalty. Uh, you can hang on the cross in my place. The wage of my sin is death, and, and you can die for me. Uh, a substitutionary, it's in my place, atonement, a payment for sin, uh, you can do. Substitutionary atonement. It's attributed to us. In, imputed righteousness, Keller will go on. Uh, it, he not only pays our penalty, but he also gifts us his perfectness. Uh, imputed righteousness is this idea that by faith, we, we not only receive his sacrifice as our own, but we receive his goodness as our own. That, that his goodness, that every step of his life was perfect, that by faith we say, I, I want your perfection, I want your obedience as my very own. I receive you. Imputed, then his righteousness, his alien other righteousness is given to us. When we repent and we believe. Repent is simply turning from where we were clinging to life and turning to Jesus to receive life in Christ. Now, we like to make it all very confusing in the Christian life. And sometimes uh, the terms that we use don't simplify the reality for us. Here's the reality when we think then, well, man, well, then who can be saved? Do I need to understand all this? Do I need to understand the Trinity or propitiation or expiation or understand all of how this comes together? And let me say to you, anyone can be saved if they just place their faith in Jesus Christ. If they would just receive the work he did. The, the stories are all through the scriptures of this simple faith that, that simply just clings to Jesus. In John chapter 9, there's this blind man. He, he, he's in the synagogue and, and he knows he's alienated because of his blindness. And, and he, he can't get into a relationship with the one true God. And, and, and Jesus comes along and he, he, he takes his blindness and he washes it away. He can see. And, and then uh, the, the blind man sees Jesus and, and he just clings to him. And he says, I was blind, but now I see. That's all I know. And I want to worship you. He can't define all these things. He can't explain the Trinity. Here's what he knows. I need saving, and you've given me my sight back. You must be the one who can save. There's moral Nicodemus who comes to Jesus in John chapter 3. And Jesus looks at him, and he just says simply, Look, if you would trust in the one who's going to hang on a cross, who's going to be lifted up for your sins, then you can be saved. You can have a new life. We find Nicodemus later in the story in John chapter 19. He's embalming Jesus. He, he is wrapping him up after his burial. He, he has uh, placed his whole life, his trust, his faith in Christ. Jesus comes to a prostitute at the well in John chapter 4. She is living a life of immorality, and, and, and Jesus forgives her, and uh, he hears her whole story, but embraces her, and then she goes back and, and says, man, I, I can't explain it all, I don't know everything, but you guys have to meet this Jesus. He knows everything I ever did, but he still loves me. She clings to him, she receives him. Rich Zacchaeus in Luke chapter 19, he lives this uh, life of cheating others, and he climbs up in this tree because he wants to see Jesus as he walks by. And Jesus says, uh, I want to stay in your house. And, and Zacchaeus, he climbs down and says, the text says, he hurried down to receive Jesus and eat with him. He transforms his whole life. He ends up uh, paying back his debts four times of what he stole from people. 
He couldn't get all the definitions right. He, he probably couldn't even talk to us about the Trinity. But what he could do is he say, I want to believe in, trust in Jesus. I want to turn from everywhere else. I'm seeking salvation and cling to Christ. That's faith. It's simply receiving who Jesus is and what he has done. So this morning, I just want to ask you, where are you seeking salvation? Anyone can be saved if they would just cling to him. You might be feeling this morning that your life is empty. You have tried everything. You've tried right relationships, right morality. You tried to get the right education. You tried to get your kids in the right schools. You've tried the right job. And none of it is bringing eternal life. The security that you thought you would find there, you do not find. A hope that you thought you'd find there, you are not finding. A value, a validation you thought you would find there, you are not finding. This morning, would you cling to Christ? Would you simply receive, uh, by, by faith, uh, through faith, would you receive the gift of grace that is purchased for you in Jesus? Would you become a son or daughter of the one true God? Every week we remind ourselves that this is our only hope. That Jesus' life, his death, his resurrection is the only way we are saved. That uh, Jesus uh, was sent from the Father, uh, the only Son of God, to live as a, a, a perfect life in our place, to die a substitutionary death in our place, and to be risen to newness of life, to give us relationship, to restore, to give us salvation with the one true God. Would you cling to him this morning? It's as simple as this, just praying, just talking to him, and with open hands just receiving him. You might not understand it all this morning, but here's what you understand. You're finding salvation nowhere else, and you want to find salvation and life and hope in Christ. Would you just cry out to him this morning? And if you have salvation in Christ this morning, would you get bold about it? Would you send an email to a million people? Would you go to your neighbor and start trying to begin conversations with, with him or her? Because you and I know the way. We know the answer, the way to salvation. It's not through the right leaders. It's not through a better education. It's not through more morality. It is through Jesus Christ. Would you get bold with your faith this morning as you're reminded that this Savior shed his blood for you, his body was broken for you, and then he rose again to give you newness of life. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your Son. Thank you, Father, that when we ask, what must I do to be saved, you answer, you have done it all. That your son lived a perfect life in our place to give us his perfection as our very own. That your son died a substitutionary death in our place that he would pay our penalty as though we had paid it ourselves. That he then didn't leave us alone, but he rose to give us newness of life, to open our eyes, to, to bring hope and security and purpose and identity into today and carry us into tomorrow when he returns. God, in this salvation, would you rise us uh, over and, and outside of our circumstance with a new joy and a new hope? And then, God, would you drive us back into and deeper into our circumstance with this new hope that we would wash the wounds of those around us, that we would rejoice over our salvation, we would boldly proclaim the good news of your Son. God, thank you for grace. It is by grace we are saved through faith. It's nothing we have done your very gift given to us in Christ. It's in him we rejoice this morning. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.